for having me and thank you for a great afternoon. Um, yeah, so I would like to talk to you today about how architecture and urban planning actually come and play a role in humanitarian assistance. From the young women from really happy faces playing soccer to unfortunately some more sad images. Um, this is um, Tacloban City in the Philippines right after the passing of Typhoon Haiyan last year in November. Um, and this is an image that we see more and more in many cities over the world. Cities are being hit by disasters, be it nat natural disasters or man-made disasters, um, which places large groups of people in a humanitarian need. Um, and the humanitarian need that I think is of most interest to us, the people here in the room, is the basic human need for shelter. The need for safe, dignified and adequate shelter. And this diagram is very much used in the, in the sector, but what it doesn't mention is that it also requires a need for a safe, dignified and adequate settlements. Because as you go in this, uh, this diagram, it shows how people's needs change after a disaster. From just needing a clothes and some, something to cover your, cover your head, it goes more into protecting yourself, insulating your house. But you cannot do that if there's not a functioning settlement surrounding you a settlement that you can function in, that you can work in, that you can live in. Um, so, disasters often also create an opportunity, because this, this picture was taken in Haiti in 2010 after the earthquake, and it shows, an, for lack of a better word, a formal settlement, which was completely devastated by the earthquake. It was wiped away. Um, there were a lot of issues in those settlements before the earthquake, Unfortunately, but slightly fortunately, it was also created a tabula rasa where you can start building back, building back better from the start, help working with the people um, to see how we can build back better and give them a nicer living environment and healthier living environment. Um, and these people living in these slums or in these informal settlements are what I see as, I call myself a humanitarian architect or a humanitarian urban planner, People living in these areas are mostly my clients, People, the, often the urban poor. So, after disaster, you go in, many actors show up. So, who are all the actors that are showing up? So, top left, the clients, the beneficiaries, the people who have lost their home. But all the other people that are in the room that have something to say, there is the government, but which sometimes actually is malfunctioning because they've so been so happily affected by the disaster themselves and sometimes or even week before. That your client is not paying for his own house or his own neighborhood. He's not making the policy. That is the government and very often also the donor, the person who's paying for the work that you do. Then the slide is very messy and it's messy for the reason. It's messy because the situation often does get messy. All the little logos show the logos of NGOs that show up after a disaster. And we have this mechanism, the cluster system. The photo at the bottom left shows a cluster meeting. A hundred people in a room trying to coordinate how are we going to assist these people um, with the need that has just risen. Anyway, actors in the room, complicated. Um, but I only have 15 minutes, so I would like to talk you through what is the... What is the process that we follow after a disaster? I call it the shelter and settlement cycle um, because there is such an enormous need and reconstruction takes a lot of time and it takes more time, too much time to give everybody a permanent house right away. People need a roof over their heads before we can reach a permanent house. So the first thing when a disaster hits, when there is a shock and houses are destroyed, is people are in need of an emergency shelter solution. Typical emergency shelter materials are tarpaulins, um, ropes, um, sticks, tents, stuff like that. So this image shows four different emergency shelter solutions. None of these are good or bad. They really, it's context specific. You can only say that they were good if you did your context research very well and you looked into what is the need of this community? What can the city offer to the people in need and what is it lacking? And what is the appropriate solution? So you could, on the top left, distribute tarpaulins because people have wood that they can salvage. So you give them tarpaulins and nails and they can build back a temporary shelter for themselves. On the top right, that's currently in Iraq, the displaced people from the, uh, the flag for ISIS. They actually started living in unfinished buildings, but the winter is coming up. So the organizations have distributed tents so that they can cover themselves from the cold. 
You can do rental subsidies, but right, which is being done a lot in the countries surrounding Syria at the moment, because those countries are still functioning and they have space to actually absorb people coming from um, from Syria. And then there is the image that we all know very well. There is your stereotype um, refugee camp. As I said, none of them are good or bad. It really depends on the context. But one thing we all agree is we follow the agreed humanitarian standards. The SPHERE standards, they are developed and agreed upon uh, minimal standards for shelter settlements and non-food items. It's a good resource, uh, this book. So, but transition, uh, emergency shelter also wears out. At one point, the tarp will start ripping and people will want to move forward because you don't want to be in a tent forever. Like, nobody wants to be in a tent. We go camping for two weeks on vacation, but that's fun for two weeks and then you're very happy to be in your own bed again, right? These people would like that as well. But still, reconstruction takes much more time and is often very complicated because of numerous issues. So therefore, in the humanitarian sector, we talk about providing transitional solutions Traditional solutions can be in numerous locations. They can either be people want to return to their place of origin, or they can return to the place of origin, or they will they will integrate in the location that they were displaced to, or they will relocate to a third location or third country. But this is not as simple because there's very many facts, as we always see in all types of urban planning and architecture. There's a lot of factors that play a role. There is land tenure, there is infrastructure that is needed, people need access to water, people need access to work, they might need technical assistance, learning advice about what Marco was saying, technical assistance on how to build safer, um, disaster risk reduction, advocacy with the government. Um, this is all, this is a lot of things to take into consideration. I just want to point out a few by giving a few practical examples. Um, First of all, transitional set, um, shelter is defined as an incremental process which supports the shelter of families affected by conflicts and disaster as they seek to maintain alter alternative options for their recovery. We really aim to set people on their road to recovery. So the transitional shelter is not necessarily a permanent house. It's also not necessarily temporary. It's really a means to set people on their road to self-recovery. This um, photo is a photo of a traditional shelter built after Typhoon Washi in the Philippines. An interesting case here was that the government had declared no build zones along the coast and people had to relocate. They had to relocate to, they were allowed to relocate to government relocation sites, but they were only allowed to stay there for two years. So we helped them design a transitional shelter model. But then we made sure that the transitional shelter was movable, so that once they would be evicted from the, the piece of land, and they would have found a new piece of land to live on, they could at least take the shelter with them. And you would think that maybe that's a bit of a weird thing, but actually this is a random Google picture from the area. It's totally in, in compliance with the culture there, the culture in the area. People, the Filipino culture of Bayanihan, which means social support, we, they move their houses on their shoulders and also the type of housing. We really look into vernacular architecture, try to give people a home that also feels like home, although they might have lost everything. Another example is um, what we did in Pakistan after the floods. Um, there have been a lot of floods that have washed away everybody's homes. And what we were seeing as we were doing a shelter project in these areas is that um, as the shelters were being built back to <coughs> the place where they were before, Actually, the rainwater of the one shelter started influencing the plinth of the other shelter, and shelters started deteriorating. There was a lot of discussion, like almost aggressive discussion at the moment of implantation. So then we started doing settlement planning exercises before we would start construction. And yeah, settlement planning is fun. That's not an urban planning thing. But actually, as the urban planning planner there, it was really, we're only the facilitator. We facilitate the process. Um, so we came with a piece of paper and the little houses, but it's the people that have the discussion. Um, and actually what they came up with was this plan. And what's interesting in this community is that women from the one tribe cannot talk to the men of the other tribe. <coughs> so what they did is the, the arch is one tribe, and then the little corner on the, on the right is the other tribe. And actually by putting their houses that way, it was not us, it was completely the community themselves. They separated the tribes and created a lot of privacy um, 
for the different communities and giving the women freedom to move around freedom, freely without their headscarves, looking after their children. And then it also turned out to be a conflict mitigation measure because now once construction started there was no more conflict. People had sorted it out beforehand, had discussed it, um, and there was no more drainage issues either because that had been discussed in advance. Um, a very complicated example is, um, I started off with uh, Taklavan in the Philippines, this is Taklavan as well. Um, and in Taklavan we aimed to offer a menu of options, because not one option fits for everyone. Um, and the default in the Philippines for the government is to provide a government relocation site. In this case, the government relocation site was 16 kilometers north of the city. Um, there were no livelihoods, no health facilities, no schools, it was all going to come but it was going to take a long time. Um, so we aimed to provide a menu of options, including the government relocation site, but we were also um, supporting affected households with building back shelter in the place where they came from, if that was allowed, uh, by supporting host families, by giving out rental subsidies. And as you can see on the map, we really tried to move people into the urban tissue. So keep people in the city, close to the area where they came from, where they're used to, where their livelihoods are. Um, and then, of course, there always still was that option of the government relocation site, which was 16 kilometers north. Another issue in working in an area like Tekloban with these informal settlements is that it's, it's, an, it's an unmapped area. People do not have an address. People do not have land tenure. Um, so as part of the project, we also did an, uh, community action planning. And the uh, little airplane on the, on the right is an, an unarmed aerial vehicle or a drone without guns. Um, and we used it to fly over the area to make a very high quality aerial photograph and actually made GIS maps of the area linking who lives where and what, what are the opportunities and the challenges of this neighborhood um, to the map and it's actually it's starting to work towards um, formalization, well, it's not formalization because we're an NGO so we cannot really formal, make it formal but at least is giving people some protection of where they used to live, what rights they have. Um, and then the last part of the shelter and settlement cycle is working towards permanent reconstruction. Permanent reconstruction sometimes is actually the same as transitional shelter because in this case in the Central African Republic, permanent, the people's standard homes are made out of mud bricks. This looks the same as the house that people have before the crisis. It's built a little bit stronger, but it looks the exact same. So in some cases, a transitional shelter can be upgraded towards a permanent house. In other cases, that is very different. I will not go into that more because I know Laura will be focusing on that. Um, so what I actually tried to say is that sheltering in the humanitarian sector, so architecture and urban planning in the humanitarian sector, is not about a product. Product. It's about. A, it's a. It's a process. Really let it be a process, let the community be the driver of the process. So I think it's a process that we can facilitate. And we can facilitate it by providing affected households with a traditional shelter or housing solution that sets them on their road to self-recovering. Um, make sure that at least the designs are according to international agreed minimal standards to make, put people in minimal uh, living conditions, but have the design focus be on the user. Um, and as an urban designer or an architect, be the process facilitator um, and try to advocate for the most vulnerable. Because in that big room with all those actors, the, your client isn't in the room. That has to be you. We have to advocate for them uh, because they do not yet, unfortunately, have that platform to step up to the government. And we can bring them to the government and bring their opinions to the government. Um, and the last thing that I think we can do is facilitate mapping and improve their access to land tenure um, and housing and property rights. <laughs>